they, they always have a little blurb in their uh, bi-monthly magazine uh, of this, and I love reading them. Um, let's see, let's, let's do uh, uh, this one. A criminal in Dayton, Ohio, may have robbed the bank, but he chose what some would call a politically correct getaway vehicle. Dayton police say the suspect, whom they did not identify, hopped on board a public bus minutes after robbing a key bank branch on March 16th, two years ago. Alerted to his getaway method by witnesses, police were able to catch up to the bus a mile down the road and arrest the man without incidents. You do with that whatever you want, but I would think that if you get on a public transit carrying loads of cash, you reach just over the bus, so and so notice. Another one, for a trio of car robbers, an accidentally placed 911 call was more than an embarrassment. It was their downfall. The group of thieves were attempting to snag a car in Middletown, New York, when one of their cell phones accidentally dialed 911 while resting in his pocket. When a dispatcher picked up the call, he heard everything. Quote, I got some guys on the phone. It's a cell phone, but it sounds like they're ripping off a car said the dispatcher who picked up the call according to WCBS radio. By the time the robbers hung up the phone, uh, the dispatcher had gotten enough GPS information to direct police to the local auto body shop where the thieves were stashing the vehicle. Let's just do one more. Why not? I just love these. Um, here's one. Uh, Vanity got the best of Levi Charles Reardon when he liked the Cascade County Montgomery, or Montgomery, Montana, Facebook page. He liked his own wanted picture. Because it displayed a wanted poster of himself. A staffer at the Great Falls Tribune took a screenshot of Reardon's Facebook activity and forwarded it to law, to, to law enforcement authorities. By April 24th, Reardon had been arrested. Police accused the 23-year-old of felony forgery after stealing a wallet and passing forged check. How vain do you really have to be to like your own wanted poster on the police Facebook page? Well, I, I, I think the word you would not use to describe these criminals would be the word shrewd. But if you know anything about this parable, or perhaps even in the subtitle in your Bible, you would see that this manager described as the shrewd manager. He is indeed shrewd. That doesn't make him any less of a crook. He might have been creative in how he was cooking books, but he's a crook nonetheless. Let's start with, with the, uh, the parable here in, in verses 1 and 9. You'll notice there in verse 1, he also said to the disciples that, that this, this suggests that, that Jesus, in the context we saw chapter 15, with like he dined with sinners, he, he tells those three stories for, for that purpose. So here in chapter 16, Luke wants us to see a connection between uh, the previous parables and what he has here. And there have been many attempts to, to show how they are related. But we should notice that there is a linguistic connection. That is found in chapter 15, verse 13. The word used to describe the prodigal squandering, or your translation may say wasting money, is the same word used here to describe the, the manager wasting or mismanaging, squandering his master's money. And so, so the, the connection is clearly there. That just as the prodigal son mismanages and squanders his, his father's wealth, his inheritance, so too this guy will squander his wealth. So many people show that, that Jesus is really zeroing in on this specific area of the prodigal's life, and that is the mismanagement of money. Nonetheless, he is, he is in charge of his master's finances, He's to make investments. He's to make sure that people who, who have borrowed from him pay everything back, and, and all the books are already filled. The problem is, is he has mismanaged his master's wealth. And so we see there in verse 2, uh, he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management. You will no longer be manager. Let me put this a different way. You thought. Right? I couldn't help but wonder what it was like for, for this man to, to, to wake up in the morning and 
So he's eating breakfast, he's reading the local newspaper and following stocks, doing whatever it is this manager would do. He's having breakfast with, with his bride, and she says, Honey, got anything going on today? She says, Oh, be, be pretty standard day. But you know, there's one odd thing is the big man, the boss, wants to meet with me first thing in the morning. I wonder what it's about. And of course, what does he do? He gets to work. And what does the boss do? The master of the house, he says, You are simply fired. And fired he is. Now, this, of course, creates a problem. If you lose your job, that creates a problem. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. And one of the big problems is you no longer have a source of income. There is no unemployment insurance here. There is no Social Security. There is no retirement. There isn't any of that. You either work or you starve. It really is. What? Sorry. It's not time for me to get worked up. That comes later in the sermon. But, uh, uh, Yes, is there's no stimulus either. Old Caesar did try something like that at one point, and it worked about as well as I remember. Well, um, uh, so, so this does create a problem. And so he, he lays out the problem there in, in verse 3. You see it there. He, he says uh, he says to himself, Self, what shall I do since my master is taking the manager away from me? He's fired me. I'm not strong enough to dig. He doesn't want to do manual labor. Uh, nor is he humble enough to, to beg. These really are your options. But right now, I could get you a job. I could put you on a farm. There are plenty of farmers looking for workers, right? If you're looking for a job bad enough, I get you a job. There's plenty of factors in this community looking to hire. I can get you a job. The question, I, I, or the issue that I, I get a lot of people who said, if you see any jobs open, let me know. I can give you about a dozen right now, right? And often the reason those don't work out is we don't want those kind of jobs. I remember it wasn't long ago when, when we were really struggling and, and some issues came up and, and someone offered me a job, literally digging the ditches and hauling rocks. Uh, they were building cabins out by, by the lake. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I dug ditches for eight hours. And I'd come home, uh, smelling the high heaven, just stinking and sweating and everything else, and, and hauled rocks. And, and I've got a video of, of the big uh, truck and dropping off uh, rocks so that we can dig it, which my son loves, you know, trucks and all that sort of stuff, so we get big bad and, and everything. And, and I remember thinking the whole time, I will do anything to provide for my family. I just didn't do this for very long, right? <laughs> you know, but, but, but perhaps, perhaps you've been in that situation, but he doesn't want to be in that situation. So what he does is he comes up with a plan, a scheme, if you will. Now the scheme is laid out in verses 4 to 8. Now there, there's a lot of debate as to how to interpret this, and, and I don't really think it's worth uh, going a lot of the details because it shouldn't affect our conclusions or our, our, our application of the passage. So let me give you just really two options first. The first is that this man renegotiates for his master. Now, the, the first problem you're going to notice here is, is the, the master gives this guy time to scheme. So he fires him and he says, turn in your books. Well, he needs to just say you're fired. Right. We'll clean out your locker for you. This is why if someone is laid off, it, there's a reason why it needs to be immediate oftentimes, right? And this guy is from the scheme. And so he renegotiates all the contracts. He would have dozens of them. You can see him picking up the phone. He's, he's hiding behind the water coach so no one can, can hear what it is that he's doing. And, and so he rene renegotiates these contracts. Now you need to know that Jewish law at this time uh, did not allow you to charge interest with another Jew. So if someone borrowed $100 from you, you cannot charge them 10% interest. They're not going to owe you $110. They're going to pay you back $100. However, if you know anything about business, if you know anything about politics, you know that every law that exists exists because someone found a loophole. Right? I mean, this is why you, the, the, the law books of this, this country, this state, this community are, are uh, uh, crazy long. And so, much like business people do today, this, these business people figure out a way around it. And it's, it's really not that creative. It's kind of common sense. What you would do is, is you would charge them with interest in the principal. You wouldn't call it interest. You would just call it principal. So, yeah, you may have borrowed $100 from the bank. To, to buy whatever it is you need to buy for, for the house. But you're going to get a bill for $120. Now, it's not interest. It's fees. You see you see that? You see that? You ever get your cell phone bill? You're thinking, I don't remember signing up for that. They just made these numbers up. Right? <laughs> you ever get you know, your, your electric bill, your light bill, any, any sort of bill you're going to get, you're going to see numbers that, that you don't remember 
largest sign of that dotted line. By the way, the same thing happens with taxes. Whenever you, you say, yeah, I'll stick it to the man, well, guess what the man's going to do? He's going to stick it to you. You can raise taxes on business all you want to, but business is going to raise it on you. And businesses exist to make money, not to pay taxes. Right? I, don't, I don't understand why, why this is a rocket science. And so if their bill goes up, your bill then goes up. Right? It's very simple. Now, they won't say we're charging you interest for taxes or we're charging you extra taxes. Right? They won't say that. It's just the cost of, of bread will go up you know, and whatnot. So, so, so th th this, is, this is really all they're doing. So, so what he does is the manager renegotiates the contracts knowing these guys borrow $100 because they're being asked to pay $200. He says, I'll tell you what. Uh, I will renegotiate the contract. Now, so long as he's manager, he has all the authority in the world to do this. And, and these guys are used to dealing with the manager who's representing the master rather than dealing with the master himself. So they assume this guy has the authority to renegotiate these contracts. Now think about it. If you owe someone $20,000, but he originally borrowed $10,000, and the, the, the bank shows up and says, you know what, don't worry about that other $10,000, just give us $10,000. Would you do everything you can to sign the dotted line? Of course you would. You just save quite a bit of money. And so we, we see that cue, right? One borrows 50 measures of oil, the debtor uh, uh, now charges them 50 instead of the original 100. Another one who was, had borrowed 80 measures of wheat, the debtor now is charged 80 measures of wheat, not 100. And the reason this is shrewd is because at the end of the day, the manager can go to these debtors and say, you owe me. I basically gave you X amount of dollars, 50 uh, uh, measures or 80 measures of wheat, or I guess it'd be 20 measures of wheat and 50 measures of oil. You owe me. While the manager, or the master rather, can say to the manager, you got me. You got me. Because he knows he isn't going to report the manager, because then it's just going to come back on him. There is another view worth looking at, and I go back and forth between these, so I, why I want to show them both with you. Again, it, it shouldn't affect our conclusion. And that is that what he does is, is he embezzles his master. So the first, renegotiate, that's the first view. The second view is he embezzles. He goes through all the contracts and renegotiates the entire debts and offers prices that, that favors him, but robs his master. This is embezzlement. Essentially, he is discounting the debt as a favor. He says in there in the text, I need a job. And what I need is one of these debtors to hire me. And so I'm going to scratch their back so they can scratch mine. This is the way it works in the political system, isn't it? And once you get in there, you never are going to leave, right? Um, and... Um, and this is exactly what, what we see going on here. Uh, now remember that in Jewish culture, when someone does you a favor, you are expected to return that favor. So if this guy has saved you 50 measures of oil or 20 measures of, of, of grain or whatever wheat that was oil, then, then you kind of owe him. And so he comes around saying, hey, uh, how about a, a job? And uh, I'm clearly good at negotiating contracts. I'm clearly good at saving you money. It would be hard to turn him down. And so he does all of this for his own benefit. But what can the master do to this guy? Can't fire him. He's already done that. So he is shrewd in how he deals with it. And in fact, with this wider interpretation, which is probably the more prominent one, uh, we see the manager not just shrewd, but very sinister. Well, that's the parable, right? It's pretty straightforward about business practices and what have been common at this time. But what do we do with the practice? Right? Well, what does Jesus want us to get out of this? So what does the shrewd business man have to do with holy living? A couple of points to make here. First of all, most agree the manager is crooked. I, I think that's pretty clear. Whether he renegotiates or, or embezzles, he's pretty crooked. He mismanages his master's wealth and then works around the system for his own benefit. Jesus is not saying, to be clear, be like this manager. This is one of the things that, that, that really stuck out to me as we go through these parables and really focus in on them, is, is sometimes Jesus uses bad characters as an illustration to, to tell us something about godly living. Uh, MacArthur points this out. He says that frankly, uh, frequently Jesus followed a regenerable pattern of teaching from lesser to greater. 
The little phrase, how much more, if an unjust judge will do this, what will God, who is a just judge, do? If an irritated man will open the door just to get rid of you, what will a God who loves you do when you knock on his door with the knee? If a wicked, evil man is shrewd in the use of money that he has access to, what will you do? It's from the lesser to the greater. And the rabbis love to teach this way to Jesus. So he's not saying, be like this shrewd, crooked guy. What he is saying is, if this guy can figure this out, and he's pretty crooked, not much more so can we apply those to the holy holy living. Then do think about it. If, if you're reading a story about a bank robbery, or maybe you're watching a movie, a classic story about a bank robbery, you, you, you can marvel at the creativity, but you're never going to say, well, Give them points for creativity. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just get, let them keep the money. But we wouldn't say that at all. Right? We, we recognize that a crime has been committed here, but still say, oh, well, you look shrewd in how they, they pull that, that crime off. So then, what, what do we do with, with this? What is the point Jesus is making here? I think there's three points of application we're highlighting that Jesus wants us to see as laid out in verses 8 to verse 7. The first point is that your future matters. Your future matters. Remember the Great Recession, 2007, 2008? It was pretty rough. Uh, I remember it well. We were new parents and still figuring out this is what it means to be an adult. The <laughs> loan, the entire economic system. In 2008, Warren Buffett gave $3 billion to GDP. The one you love to have in your back pocket, $3 billion. I mean, he knows, like, hey, whoever owns GD, I'll have my people call you. <laughs> you know I and mean? you need $3 billion? Have I got a deal for you? He didn't have a good deal. It's a very shrewd deal. With that $3 billion investment, it helped keep GD close. In return, Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, which were my friends, they were given $3 billion in preferred stock and warrants on GD at $22.25 per share at any time over a five year period. So no matter how high their stocks went up, they got them at a premium price. Plus, Buffett got a 10% dividend on the preferred shares. In the end, GE paid the $3 billion back to Warren Buffett, plus the 10% premium for the preferred shares in 2011. This indeed is true to his deal. He made it off. He was able to buy himself and, and everyone else around him dinner. That's what I'm trying to get, right? Very shrewd business deal. Now, here's the question. What good is that when it comes to eternity? A shrewd investor cares for both his immediate and future needs. This shrewd manager mismanaged his masters well, but he secured his own financial future before he walked out of that door. Isn't that way we live our lives? This is why we today, we have retirement plans, we have investments, savings, insurance. We have all of these things so that, so, so that yes, we, we, we want today to be secure, but we also want to invest in our future. One of the things I've noticed in following uh, particularly presidential campaigns, this happens in every campaign, is during the primary season, right, you, this, this candidate has all these staffers. But after Iowa or New Hampshire or South Carolina or Florida, wherever it is that they, they bow out, they'll quit, right? And it isn't long before this campaign staffer, whose job it was, was to tear down this campaign, is now working for that campaign. Have you ever noticed this? Right? And now why is that? Because, yes, they may believe this guy or gal is the best option. But what they care about most is their own financial future, right? They need a job. And sure, this guy may not be the best option, but he gives it. Right? That's every uh, presidential campaign I've ever seen. Now, if this is true for <coughs> godly investors, how much more should it be for us who invest primarily in eternal things? This is what he's saying, particularly in verses 8 and 9. Um, the master commended the dishonest man for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by the you know that as well. So that when it fails, they may receive you into, into 
to eternal dwelling. What he's saying here is that life is a vapor. Why then do we invest so much in it? Isn't this James' point in James chapter 4? What is life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Vanishes. Jesus is not suggesting that wise investment and good financial planning are ungodly, but rather that we, as sons of light, should invest in something more eternal. So then what do we mean, or what does Jesus mean here, by investing in our future? What do the words like love, charity, mercy, kindness, justice, grace, forgiveness, faithfulness, generosity, these words mean anything to us? Do you work as hard for your eternal investments as you do your temporal ones? In Matthew 25, Jesus describes himself as the final judge. And I trust you're familiar with this text, right? You remember that Jesus says, look, I'll, I'll, I'll divide right to left, sheep and goats. And I'll look the one on the right and I'll say, uh, well done, good and faithful servant, right? All this sort of stuff. He says, when I, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you, you gave me something to drink. And then what, what are those on the right going to say? Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you naked? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. That is an investment in an eternal future. What about Jesus in Matthew 6, who says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust and inflation destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in, and government cannot uh, cause inflation. Right? Don't invest in those things. He's, he's not against it. He said, don't make it your, 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 your future and your hope is in those things. After all, you never see you all behind the curse in those same things. I think that a good illustration of this is actually comes from John Piper. His most famous sermon was preached at a passion uh, uh, event uh, in the 1990s called, You Have One Life, Don't Waste It. This is really the genesis of his Don't Waste Your Life uh, uh, books and, and all that sort of stuff. Henry, he tells a story of how... Uh, there were two members of his church who had died overseas doing mission work. They were two elderly ladies who were retired nurses who had spent their retirement in this third world country uh, giving out vaccines and helping with, with basic needs. And what happened was they were on a bus going to the next uh, mission field or whatever they were doing, and, and the bus simply fell off the cliff and they died. He said, you've got to ask yourself, hey, here are two women who have lived full lives. What are they doing? Spending their, to the end of their life, which is like 100 years of their life, overseas in a third world country giving little kids a shot. I do that. He says, and I compare that to this, this American dream vision we have. And there he reads from Reader's Digest. For you millennials and Gen Zers, you may want to Google that. Or just go to uh, any Goodwill, you'll find volumes of Reader's Digest reading lists, right? It's the bridge of all those books. Just, you, 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 you got plenty of homework now. But, but the article they had in Reader's Digest he was highlighting was called Start Now, Retire Early. And in that article, it, it describes how a, a couple had retired early. They, they had saved all this money. They made all these investments. They worked all the years. They retired early. And they were spending their retirement collecting chips. Collecting chips. And then he concludes with this. He says, look, the day will come when we will stand before God. And we will give account for everything we do. He says, what would this couple say? They will look at the Lord and says, look, Lord, our shell collection. This is what we've done with the time you've given us. A shell collection. Of course, it's madness, isn't it? But that is the American dream you are being served. That I have been served. The future matters. Future in this life and in the next. Secondly, your stewardship matters. The second world knows one cannot be trusted with much until proving they are competent with a little. Isn't that what you see there in verse 10? One who is faithful in a little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. This is a biblical principle we, we, we see throughout. But we also understand even the second one, this makes sense. That's so why we don't like nepotism. Right? Um, if, if, if it's perceived that someone has this position because their uncle runs the, the company, or because their daddy got in the job, 
or whatever it might be, it really bothers us. I, I heard a, a sports broadcaster uh, complain one time that, that they uh, here they are, they, they, they've invested their entire career in, in this, and they went to school for this, and they have, they have uh, been mentored by the best. And he said, it gets frustrating, there's limited jobs in the field, but athletes who, don't, who know nothing about the art of sports broadcasting are given jobs because they're a recognized name. Now, that's not nepotism, but it, it, it's similar to that, isn't it? There's that feeling that maybe they haven't earned it quite yet. But whatever your opinion is about sports broadcast, I really don't care, nor do I think it matters. But we do love stories, right, of those who, who start at the bottom of a company and work their way up. Can I give you a few examples of that? Mary T. Barrett is the CEO and chairwoman of General Motors. At age 18, she worked on the assembly line inspecting hoods and fenders. Doug McMillan, a great last name if you're going to be the CEO of Walmart. He began working at Walmart while in high school. He took a job loading trucks at a Walmart distribution center in order to save for college. He was earning $6.50 an hour, which I believe was probably above the minimum wage at the time. My minimum wage when I worked at the store in high school was like five something. Finally, Chris Rondeau, President, didn't pronounce his name right. He's the CEO of Planet Fitness. In 1993, he joined the company as a front desk receptionist in New Hampshire. 20 years later, he rose to the ranks to become its CEO. You look at it, you think, there's no way that guy can pick up a phone without crushing it. But he started as a receptionist. We love these stories, right? But it's, it's, it's a simple principle he has here. Those who are trusted with a little can be trusted with more. Those who are dishonest with a little are going to be dishonest with more. Can I prove this to you? Lottery winners. Athletes. Here's the reality. If, if, if you're going from, from being dirt poor and in debt, and now you've inherited $100 million before taxes, so $20, <laughs> guess what? It will not be long before you're out of that money. ESPN has an entire 30 for 30 documentary that chronicles this among athletes. And they show why is it that there's, there's a, a, an epidemic of, of, of athletes who, who, who are paid millions, tens of millions of dollars only within a few years of retirement to be completely broke and bankrupt. Why is that? Well, they give all these reasons for, for this and that. But let me tell you what, what it comes down to. You can't be trusted with a little. You can't be trusted with a lot. You certainly can't be trusted with an overwhelming amount overnight. So too, if you are dishonest with a little, you will be dishonest with much. The same is true with your spiritual journey. Maybe you want God to do more with your life. Are you faithful with what God has trusted you with now? If you can appreciate the blessings that God has given you now, perhaps then he'll give you more. But if you're bitter about where you are right now, Will anything change with more? You may want to change the world if you're unwilling to offer simple prayers, memorize verses, or share your faith. How will you be trusted with more? You can't be trusted with the simple. Isn't this Jesus' point elsewhere in Matthew 25? Uh, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will sit you over much. And you should enjoy it. You see it there in verse 12, with the, the, the connection with, with the parable there. You have been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own. That's a clear connection to the parable, right? It's, it's fascinating, isn't it, that when this shrewd manager was asked to handle the finances of someone else, he mismanaged it. But when he was asked to handle his own finances, well, yeah, he could be quite confident with that hand. He cared about his financial security. But was incompetent with someone else's. This reminds us of, of the a parable we saw several weeks ago in Luke chapter 12. Remember, it's the guy, he's going to build all these big barns, and he's going to sit back and relax, you know, collect details, of course. What did Jesus say? I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods. Lay up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. And like this rich fool that we see here in Luke 12, we see that we care about our preferences. We, can't, we don't care about anyone else. So too, like this rich fool, too many of us fail to see that we are managers 
of God's blessing. All that we possess is God's. It's easy to apply that to something like charity and generosity, isn't it? How many of us will say that I will be generous when I have enough? that ever happened that way? No. No. Generosity doesn't start out of abundance. It comes out of a hard faith. A lot of people who have things in abundance, they're just as tight now as they were. They are just making it by. In fact, statistics show that. Your future matters. Your stewardship matters. Finally, your worship matters. That's his point there, verse 13, isn't it? No servant can serve two masters, for either you hate the one or the other. You be devoted to the one who despises the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, chapter 16 zeroes in on the issue of wealth and our relationship to it. And this text makes it very clear, particularly the last line there, verse 13. I think it's pretty obvious that throughout all of human history, wealth, power, and, and, and stuff like that are is a universal item. And we don't need to look any farther than the rise of the prosperity heresy among American evangelicalism, right? The prosperity heresy is only something that can happen in a rich country like America. The prosperity heresy did not stem from third world Africa. It comes from the United States, where we see ourselves as consumers and givers. And so if we can make God someone who must fulfill our entitlements, That'll sell. That'll sell. And so, so, so the prosperity of heresy makes sense in American context. However, we don't have to give the charlatans on twisting the Bible lightly still and, 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 and still not fall for it. We fall for it whenever we, we tell ourselves that a, a life lived faithful to the church entitles us to a life apart from suffering. We do this all the time, right? How many people have abandoned the gospel, abandoned faithfulness to the local church because something bad happened to them? A tragedy struck. What are we communicating there? We were trying to worship two saviors. We were serving two masters. And when asked to choose between one of them, we chose the wrong one. This is what Jesus is warning them here. You cannot serve both God and your idol. If, think about it this way. If you possess all that you desire, everything you ever desire, wealth, family, Respect, power, influence, you name it. And you had all of it, yet you lacked one thing. Jesus wasn't there. Would you call that world heaven? Likewise, if you possessed nothing you ever desired, well, family, respect, power, influence. But all you had was Christ and Him to the fullness. Would you call it him? The answer to that question will determine whether, whether or not we've chosen to, to serve God and God alone, or if we do in our heart of hearts choose our idols. Isn't this what we saw with the rich young ruler? He wants to serve two masters, and Jesus demands choose one. Because it isn't just that your future matters or your stewardship matters, but your worship matters. Choose today your Savior or your own. I think it's clear Jesus doesn't want us to mimic a shrewd, crooked manager. He does want us to learn from it. May we invest in eternity the way this man invests in his own life. May we invest in the kingdom. May we invest in the glory of God.
2 o'clock, uh, prayer, Wednesday, 6.30, Bible study, and don't forget Sunday school and everything uh, next Sunday. Easter's coming up, so we're working on uh, what that's going to look like. We're going to have a good Friday service, the Friday before, so we're looking forward to that. Um, and we won't have to do it on the radio like we did last year. Uh, we're going to do it in here. Uh, so very excited about that. Um, we have uh, some special guests with us here this evening. Uh, I don't know if you, you saw them or not. Uh, their names are John and Lisa Earl. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Be sure to make them feel welcome. Give us a heater, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they go down to Florida while we suffer under the, uh, the ice and snow and floods. And they're sitting down there by the beach laughing at us. Uh, We're so. laughing with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It didn't feel like it, <laughs> so, but uh, it really is really good to have, have y'all back, um, and the safe trip and everything. I worked all those years for retirement and, and got to enjoy it, so we're, we're really glad to have you guys back. Um, I wouldn't say that to your face, but we are glad to have you back, and uh, uh, so really exciting. Uh, good turnout tonight, so thank you all uh, for everything. Hope to see you tomorrow or Wednesday, if not next Sunday. Remember, Gospel Every Home is something that we are all adopting. Uh, tell the world about Jesus. Uh, if you want to double this church, it's quite simple. If every single one of us reaches one person over the next 12 months, we'll double. It's as simple as, as that. It is very difficult, it seems. Let us focus on that. One person, who is your one person that God's laying in your heart to reach? Let us focus on that. Uh, with that, um, John, would you want to close this up for